All right, so strengthening your marriage. Uh, so again, it's good to see everyone here. Uh, we've got a, quite a, a mixed group, um, some people that have been at it a while. And uh, so maybe some of you guys have some good tips. Um, but we'll see how that goes um, as, we, as we go through this thing. So uh, if you want to, we'll start, we're going to start in uh, Proverbs chapter 14, 20, in verse 23. Proverbs chapter 14, in verse 23. And I hope my voice <coughs> holds on. We had a, I was sick all last week. I couldn't hardly speak at all Monday. So it's coming back. So hopefully it holds on. So Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 23. Proverbs 14, 23 says this, In all labor there is profit, but the, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury or poverty. But the first part of that, I want to bring your attention to that. In all labor there is profit. We have, uh, again, we have three children. We raise them and, hey, work, work, work. There's no, there's no, there's nothing bad is going to come for you for working, right? Work, 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 right? And there's profit in working. And uh, always good things come for those that are going to work. Well, it's the same thing in our marriage. Same thing in our marriage. We got to put the work in, right? We got to put the work in. It's not just magic. It doesn't just happen. Uh, you guys have been married a few years. You know it doesn't just doesn't come automatically. You, you know, you get married and oh, if my spouse is going to be amazed at how wonderful I am, right? Maybe you have that thought, and then the second day happened, <laughs> right after you were married. <clears throat> but but seriously, um, it's 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 it takes work, right? We're sinners. That's the problem, right? We're all sinners. That's the problem. We're all sinners, and we're selfish. Um, Ted Tripp, I don't know if you know that name, but he's the one who wrote the book. Uh, that they're doing shepherding a child's heart and I, he gave an illustration this guy's a great godly man uh, this for years in the word and, and, and all this stuff he's married you know, family and all this kind of stuff but he gives an illustration of it before bedtime they, him and his wife will get ice cream and he'll be the servant he'll be the servant right so he pops down there and gets this for his wife and then he's he you know, I think he talked about uh, like cookies and ice cream and doesn't sound doesn't that sound good right right about now, but anyways he does all this and he does the ex exact same scoops whatever three scoops and whatever, and and he he's talking about being selfish, and here he says here I am I'm I'm as I'm walking up I'm looking at this which is the bigger pea which is the bigger bowl right. Right? And here he is doing the same thing. Here he is, a godly man, been saved for years. He lectures, writes books, and he has the same thing that we all do. Sin. Selfishness. That's the problem. That's our problem in marriage, right? So a good marriage is built, right? Just like faith in each other is built, just like, just like trust is built, like a brick wall, day by day, brick by brick, brick by by brick. So to build anything, to build anything, uh, it needs a blueprint. You need a blueprint to build anything. A church building, a house, a deck, a car, whatever. Whatever it is, you need a blueprint. So God's word, that's what we're going to be looking at, God's blueprint uh, for marriage. So there, there's one statement, and it was, it was amazing to me, and I didn't, I didn't think about this, but God mentions this one statement about marriage four times. Four specific times, one in the Old Testament and three in the New Testament. Let's look in. Uh, let's 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 go ahead and read these things. If somebody could read Genesis chapter two, verse twenty-four, can somebody read that one? And then somebody else could read Matthew nineteen, four to six. Who's got Matthew nineteen, four to six? Anybody? Luke. All right. Then how about somebody? Mark ten, verses six through nine. Mark ten. Who's got that one? All right, go ahead. And then Ephesians 5.31. Ephesians 5.31. All right, go ahead. Very good. Yeah, if we can look those up. So these are the times. These are one, two, three, four. Four, four passages. This is what God says about marriage. So if somebody could read Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Who's got that one? Anybody? Genesis 2.24. Go ahead, yes, Vanessa. Therefore shall a man leave father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Right. Right. <clears throat> uh, Matthew 19, 4 to 6. Yeah, go ahead, Luke. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave his 
father and mother, the three to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Right. Thank, thank you. How about Mark 10, 6 through 9? Right, and then Ephesians 531. 531? Yep. 531. Uh, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. One flesh. We see it, one flesh. Leave and cleave. One flesh. And then we see it's permanent, right? Think about it. So one time before sin entered, one time before sin entered the world, three times after. Right? The devil deceived Adam and Eve. We know what happened in the garden. We know what happened there. Uh, sin entered. There was a curse. But what, what changed? What changed at, at the garden? Everything changed. Right? Everything changed. The curse of sin. Uh, God, God's relationship with man. Think of it before the fall. God would come down and commune with man. Walk in the cool of the day. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that? I mean, that's bizarre to think about that. That's what that was, that was before sin, but then there was sin. Right, so that changed. How about man and wife relationship? Now they're sinners. Now there's an opportunity to butt heads. The sweat of the brow, hard work, pain and childbearing, right? Man, man versus the animals. We see what's, we can see with everything. What, what changed? Everything changed. It's hard to imagine a more beautiful place in the garden, but sin entered, things changed, except God's plan for marriage did not change. It did not change. God, it was good for the perfect man and woman. It was good for the, per for the sinful man and woman. It's still God's plan, one flesh, leave and cleave, permanent. So, listen, there's many unhappy marriages, <clears throat> unfulfilled marriages, among saved and unsaved alike. Right? We can look around. And they think marriage is outdated in our, in our culture today, old-fashioned. What's the point? <clears throat> but a vast majority of these failures is because they didn't follow God's blueprint. Right? I think we would all agree. We'd all agree with that. Um, uh, it's, when you ignore the, the design of the designer, there's going to be problems. Right? Um, I was at home. Uh, Colleen, was, she, was, she was out of town for like a week. 10 days, and then, and then she was sick some of the time. So I was, I was there. I was, I was taking care of business, right? Washing this and doing all that thing. You know, I think of, I think of the dishwasher. Well, you know, you can think of uh, washing clothes and uh, it's a dishwasher, washing clothes, throw it all in the same thing. It doesn't, what does it matter, right? It's a washer. It wouldn't work out, right? It's not designed Clothes aren't designed for to be in the right. It's just not work. It's not going to work, and that's exactly what happened. So, what does God design for marriage look like, and what does it involve? So, so back to Genesis chapter two. We're going to start there, and we'll move along. But Genesis chapter two, verse twenty-four says this: Therefore, a man <coughs> shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Husbands and wives leave father and mother. That's what it is. That's what it's supposed to be. Does it seem strange that Adam and Eve they didn't have anybody to leave? They were the only ones there. But that's that's God's that's God's principle. So what does it mean to leave parents? So that's where we're at. What does it mean to leave parents? Certainly does not mean to abandon them, forsake them. Uh, Exodus chapter twenty verse twelve is the fifth commandment: is honor right, honor thy father and thy mother. Um, it doesn't mean you must move a thousand miles away. They're about that for Texas is about a thousand miles away, right? It doesn't mean that doesn't mean we're, you're, to leave our parents. It doesn't mean that at all. But to leave parents means that your relationship to your parents is radically different. It's radically different. It has to change. Um, you establish an adult, an adult relationship. Um, you imagine here you are. You're married. You've been married for a while, and hey. Your mom calls, hey, it's 11 o'clock, get in bed, you know, or one of those things. Or, hey, what are you eating? Are you eating, are you eating snacks after whatever time? No, it's not that at all, right? It's, it's, not, it's not time for that. But it radically must change. <clears throat> um, you must now be concerned about your spouse 
ideas, opinions, practices more than your parents, right? Over your parents. That's a that's a huge that's a huge deal, right? We have to we have to go there. We have to be there. Um, uh, leaving means you must be not be so dependent on your parents' affection, approval, assistance, counsel. Why? Because you, now you're trying to be one flesh with your spouse, right? Um, I, I think the other thing is like it's sometimes sometimes people have a real hard time with their parents. It's time to grow up, right? It's time to grow up. Eliminating wrong attitudes. Here's newsflash: uh, parents and kids always don't see eye to eye, right? And they grow up, and we have these issues, and oh man, I, I'm not going to. No, we we need to pass that up. We have to let that stuff go. We need to work through some things. It's time to grow up. So. Uh, what, it, what it leaving means, it means you stop trying to change your spouse into someone your parents approve of. Uh, that You can see a problem there, right? We can see a problem, an obvious problem. Um, how about this one? You, you drag your parents in, well, my dad always does this, or my mom, well, my mom makes it cookies like this, or whatever. You can see a, a problem, right? We can see a problem that would come there. So it means that you make your husband, your husband or your wife's relationship, your priority relationship. It's your priority human relationship. It's your primary human relationship. Um, it's not, that's the main focus. That's the main focus. Not your girlfriends, your buddies at work, the bowling league, the fishing, hunting, hunting clubs or whatever. Even not your parents, right? The primary one is your, is your spouse. It has to be there. That's, that's where it has to be. That's where the things. So changes need to be made. Sometimes changes need to be made in, in couples, in husband and wife, uh, we need to sit down, and, and in the in the book, in the in the book, there's some there's some questions and, and stuff those, those to go through those things to ask those things. So, so here's another one. So, um, this might fit a lot of our group. If you're parents of newlyweds, if you're parents of newlyweds, there's changes that you need to make as well, right? One of the goals for your kids is to prepare them to leave, <laughs> right? That's the goal for us as parents to grow your have your kids grow up and leave you don't hang on and that you don't we don't they don't stay right spread their wings uh and let them go um years ago we were on a family vacation we we're out in colorado june end of june and we went on a hike up in the mountains and there's snow everywhere it was amazing right colorado who would have thunk it right so we we took a break and we we're all there we have the th three kids and i think our youngest was maybe first second grade or something so we all sat down for a break drinking stuff and having snacks little the little uh, the, those, those uh, peanut butter cookies, those yellow ones, little package thing, whatever. So the kids are eating those, and these chipmunks are these chipmunk comes running up. You know, they must be used to people feeding it. Like, don't there's signs all over. Don't feed the animals. Don't. Well, this thing comes right up to us, and Kayla's holding this. She's got this crack in her hand. She's standing there, and this thing comes right up her pant leg, right up her arm, and and just grabs that grabs that cookie or that little pretzel thing or whatever the the cracker thing peanut butter cracker just grabs it right out of her hand it was it was it happened so fast it was but it was like a split second of what are you gonna do and she just like let go and it just doom, took off of it you know it was the funniest it was the funniest thing she just you know she's like and then she did she bought and started crying and that was my only cracker or whatever right but that chipmunk knew what he was doing <laughs> she came and it was a it was a, a she just let it go, and that thing took off. So it's the same thing I think of when what, us as parents of children. You got to let them go. Just let them go. You got to let them go. They have to. They have to. They have to move on. Um, we need to. We need to let them go. We need to see. It's a test, mom and dad. How how did you do? How did you do raising them? Right. It's one of the most unnatural things as a parent. Right. You've done it. It's one of the most unnatural things. You raise them, you protect them, you clothe them, you feed them all these years. You do all these things, uh, but then it's time for them to go. It's time, for the, it's time to let them go. It's needful. It's right. It's difficult, but it's God's way. We have to do that. We have to do that. You have to set some boundaries. Um, maybe in your, with your spouse and your parents, your in-laws, you know, that, can get, that can get a little sticky, but we have to set some, we have to set some boundaries. Because it's again, again, it's you and your spouse. It's that's the primary, that's the primary relationship. <clears throat> that's the one. <clears throat> we we need we as parents need to back off, and let this new young husband be the head of his home, right? Even if he's making some decisions that we wouldn't, right? 
We need to encourage the new wife to look to her husband for leadership, <coughs> decision-making, companionship, affection. That's not our place anymore. Now, if, you, if they ask for help, of course, of course, we can, we can help, right? Uh, and, of course, we can help with that, right? But remember, <coughs> we've got to let it go. So, so leave, leaving mother and father. Okay, so uh, second, uh, God's bl- blueprint for marriage directs husbands and wives to cleave to one another. This is a principle for marriage of all time. Um, this, this one flesh idea. And so we're going to be talking about this one flesh all the way through all, the, all, those, all these lessons. Um, it's about this one flesh. So Adam and Eve were given a command to cleave, to cleave to one another. Um, many today enter into marriage with the idea of it doesn't work out. They're already got an exit strategy, right? Uh, not feeling from f- fulfilled. If I'm not happy, I'm out. We hit the eject button, divorce. Remember your wedding vows. Remember the wedding vows? Remember you pledge to be faithful uh, in sickness and health, richer for poor, and death do us part. Many today write their own vows, right? We've seen these things, right? They write their own vows. And all right, whatever. It's cute, whatever. But you know what? Life isn't cute. <laughs> Life is hard, <laughs> right? Life is hard, and it can be really hard. And for some, some marriages, it's a matter of convenience, a chance, or some say, why bother at all getting married, right? So we need to, we need to remember those vows, right? So uh, that's not what God intended. It's not what God intended for this thing just to be a convenience thing. It's an easy thing. So let's look in, in Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verses 6 through 9. I know we already read this, but <clears throat> what is this? it says this, But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. What God hath put, had joined together, let not man put asunder. This idea of one flesh, and we're going to be, again, we're going to be talking about it more, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing, it's amazing concept to think. It's a, it's a, it's a thing we're striving for, one, one flesh. You're trying to, you're going there, right? Um, they're trying to cleave together to be one flesh forever. Marriage, then, is not a matter of blind chance, but a deliberate choice. It's a del- deliberate choice. If you think it's blind chance, you watch too many Hallmark movies, right? It's just, you know, this happened, I just fell in love, and blah, whatever. It's deliberate choice. It's a deliberate choice. It's not a matter of convenience, but obedience to a holy God. A good marriage doesn't just happen by accident, but by how much you are determined to work at it. Um, you, you look around, and some people have been married for some years. And there's been some hard times, I'm sure. There's been some difficult times, but we just keep working at it. Keep working at it, right? A good marriage is based more on commitment than feelings. Let's look in uh, Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2, verse 14. Can somebody read that? <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. Sure. It says, Yet ye say, Wherefore, because the Lord has been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast to whom thou hast dealt dealt you, against whom thou hast dealt uh, treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. All right. Um, if you're just in the in these classes with Nehemiah, we had kind of they kind of touched on this, and that's what the people were doing. The the, the, the Jewish people were they're putting away their wives and they were getting taking younger wives. It's and it's an abomination, and 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 God spoke against that. Obviously, God is a witness. He's a witness in this covenant that you made between you and your wife, right? The wife of your youth. He was there. God, God, he was there when you made those commitments. We made a promise. We made a vow to be faithful regardless of what happens. Regardless of what happens. I want you to think back on your wedding day. Think back. Some of you go way back. It goes way back. I'm sure it was beautiful flowers. The photographer was there. Uh, everyone was dressed up. I'm sure there was love in the air, in the air, right? And then the honeymoon. 
right? Sweet. Are you kidding me? Think about, talk about, talk about fantasy land, right? I don't know where you went, but, or you didn't even get a chance to go, but man, it was wonderful, right? But, uh, but you know what happens? Life happens. <laughs> you come back to earth. You have bills to pay. You got to pay for this. You got to pay for all these things. Um, fast forward a few years, things get busy. Maybe a few kids, a house, juggling work, family, church, paying bills, sprinkling car repairs, sickness, hot water tank goes out, right? Things get busy, and you're a million miles away from those good feelings, right? You're a million miles away from those things. But listen, it's at that moment that a marriage is based on commitment before God, uh, before an almighty God can not just survive, but it can thrive because we're doing it God's way, because we're helping each other. We're that, th- that, that, threefold cult, that threefold cord, right? It's a husband and wife with God. He's strengthening us. That's, that's, where, that's where we can be. Um, those feelings, feelings, they come and go. Um, it's good to have feelings. It's good to get all revved up about our wife in a good way or a husband revved up. That's good. Those are good things, right? But our feelings can't be trusted, right? So the biblical marriage is based on commitment. And it's based on obedience to that vow that you made before God and witnesses. That the wife promises to be faithful even if the husband is afflicted by bulges, by baldness, <laughs> by bifocals. Even if he loses his health, wealth, and job. Uh, that a husband promises to be faithful to his wife, uh, the wife of his youth, even if she loses some of her beauty, some of the charm. Right? Sometimes she spends money foolishly. Has anybody realized, and you guys realize how much a haircut for a woman is? I mean, guys, it's the best cuts, 10 bucks or whatever. But the girls, it's not, it's not, that, it's not that simple, right? It's not that simple. Um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. These little things, it doesn't matter. You made a promise. You made a vow to each other, a vow of commitment. Remember, the goal is oneness. Therefore, you accept full responsibility and commit yourselves to each other, regardless of what problems arise, right? So <clears throat> that's the first, just, just getting into getting into marriage. So following God's blueprint for marriage is the, is, is, the, is the key for a successful marriage. The two shall be one. We gotta continue, we'll build in that. And we're gonna, you have to work at this. Two shall be one, two shall be one. The leaving and cleaving, you leave what's happened before, you cleave to that which is, which uh, your which your with your spouse, right? Marriage is about a commitment and obedience to God, rather than than based on happiness or feelings. So, marriage is is God's way for a man and woman to live together. That's where we're at. Raise a family, serve one another, serve Him for His glory. That's the plan, and that's the plan. So we need to work. Let's work at it. The strengthening. <clears throat> strengthening our marriage. That's that's basically where we're at to start uh, tonight. Um, appreciate you.